Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we'll talk market resilience, market upside. Yesterday, it was all about more defensive positioning with the sell-off into the close. Today, it was more about a rally that just continued to the upside. I was so many macro drivers to think about. Fed meeting today, a lot of technology companies reporting. In the end, I think the charts give you the clarity to see what's actually happening and the vote of confidence to the upside. Stocks like AMD breaking to, uh, to new highs. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar opportunity to look at the charts together, try to learn what we can from the uh, patterns and how they've evolved over the last 24 hours. I didn't mention in the introduction, my guest, uh, Louis Giannis from WealthNet, uh, coming to us from the Denver area. I'm super excited to, uh, to have Louis on the show. I heard him at a uh, at the CMT symposium a number of years ago and was super impressed with his quantitative discipline, we talked about factors and I uh, enjoyed it so much. So I was super excited when I had a show that I could start inviting people like Lewis to uh, join me for. So very excited for him to share his take on what he's seeing with you. You know, today, as I mentioned, it was all about, uh, you know, risk off yesterday in the short term. But as we talked about, that was a short term distribution. It's all about the longer term trends and how they've evolved. Days like today show you the resilience of the uptrend and why even though there are bearish divergences, even though there is potential for downside, as long as the market keeps making higher highs and higher lows, the trend remains positive. Now, I mentioned Louis Giannis joining us uh, shortly today. Tomorrow, we have Larry Berman joining us uh, from, uh, from Toronto, from ETF Capital Management, uh, to, uh, to give us more of a uh, Canadian perspective on what's happening with the, re with, the, with the run in gold materials. It'd be interesting to hear his take on, uh, on what's next. Next week on the show, we have Andrew Thrasher joining us on Tuesday, Gary Dean from SentimentTiming.com joining us on Wednesday, and uh, then on Monday, August 3rd, Behind the Charts, which is our show focused on you know, more understanding how uh, analysts, strategists, successful traders approach the market using charts, try to get inside their head a little bit. It's an interview style show. We met with Al Brooks. Uh, Al's a, uh, an MD, and he's one of a group of MDs. We had Joe Duarte uh, contributing to a number of people that uh, have a background or even pr still practicing medicine, but have found ways to, uh, you know, to apply their uh, discipline, their knowledge, uh, skill set to investing. So Al Brooks had a really good conversation with him and how he learned to day trade in the late 80s or on the 87 crash. Let's get to our market recap. So as I mentioned, you know, I, I, I was on a, a show earlier today, an interview um, for Forex Analytics called their face interview with Dale Pinkert and others. And uh, he asked me a number of questions just about the overall conditions and, and what I was seeing with the broad markets and, and what I described to him was, you know, just like on the macro side, you have these macro headwinds and tailwinds. You have the potential headwinds of, uh, you know, a very accommodative Fed that has said they will do essentially whatever they need to, you know, prop up the economy and prop up the markets. Um, you have uh, earnings that potentially are a positive catalyst or negative, depending on what happens. But overall, it's seeming to net uh, sort of a positive relative to expectations. But you also have the potential headwinds of uh, the coronavirus, and and uh, you know who knows what it's on, you know who knows what we uh, what we don't know tomorrow, and and how things could evolve, unrest in cities, and how that that might uh, spook investors. So you know, there's no real. Uh, and, you know, there's no way of knowing what's going to come up, what's going to come tomorrow that we haven't figured out yet. It hasn't been priced in yet. And I think from a technical perspective, you have that balance as well. If you look at a chart of the S&P 500, you have a market making higher highs. And today's rally, you know, pushed us back above 3250, which is uh, which is pretty important. You know, I think the previous swing high from uh, from last week is really the level you want to look at. If we're able to eclipse that, that certainly gives a, a vote of confidence for further upside, but you have higher highs in price, you have lower peaks in the RSI. And we've talked about that divergence in recent weeks, if not months with, uh, with technology and, and most tech names, especially the big tech names have that bearish divergence, higher highs in price, lower peaks in RSI, Apple, maybe a good example of that. Having said that, 
divergences are fine. Th that's what puts it on the list of things to look out for. If you know, if you're an analyst, I, I feel like. But what what compels you to take action on it is where you start to see weakness in price. You see the price actually following through on that divergence, and that is what we continue to not see. The market keeps making higher highs, keeps making higher lows, and I think we've just established a higher swing low around 3,200, which means at this point we remain above 3,200, and I think the uptrend still is in, in place. If this is a long position in the S&P, that's where you'd probably bump a trailing stop up to to you know, lock in further profits. So again, we keep making these higher lows until that pattern changes. I'm, I'm inclined to assume that the path of least resistance is, is upward. Having said that, I can list out plenty of fundamental and or technical factors that suggest that there should be weakness. But again, the charts remind you that to, to follow the price and not not should have, uh, you know, should have and, and start uh, think of things that should have happened or should happen, focus on what is happening. In terms of what actually happened today, as I mentioned, the S&P finishing up stronger, one and a quarter percent above uh, just below 32.60. Mid caps and the small caps up even more. So the small cap index really led the way higher up two and a half percent. That really was off to the races through uh, the majority of the day. Um, technology actually spent much of the day at the top of the return list for the 11 S&P sector. Settled down uh, to actually be in the, about in the middle, outperform the S&P, but overall sort of in the middle of the pack. Uh, right around uh, healthcare, what did actually get it done was energy, financials, real estate. And we're going to look at REITs in a little bit because that's a sector I think people tend to not pay attention to or not think of as a uh, as a legitimate sector of interest because it was part of financials for the longest time. But, you know, REITs actually doing pretty well with a decent dividend component as well. On the downside, you have the defensive groups that worked pretty well yesterday for the most part down at the bottom of the list today. So consumer staples uh, just up a little bit, but overall sort of flat from yesterday, utilities and materials uh, after that. There are a number of stocks that made some monster moves today. And as a reminder, right, we're in the middle of earnings season, which means you have huge uh, earnings risk or headline risk with some of these, uh, some of these stocks. So it's an, it's an important time to be very aware of when stocks that you're holding or stocks that you're looking at are reporting earnings. As a reminder, so we have a feature called the Simple Summary, uh, which we don't talk about on the show as, as much, only because with limited time, we're trying to pay attention to uh, trying to pay attention to the um, uh, the charts and focus and getting through as many of those as we can. Um, but as a reminder, we have this uh, tool called the Simple Summary, and if you type in a symbol, if you type in a ticker, what it's going to do is it's going to tell you if uh, there's an earnings release. So for example, here on Amazon, you can see a little blue uh, highlight saying Amazon reports earnings tomorrow. So we'll flag actually the upcoming earn earnings dates. And, and it's an important thing to remember just with names that you're looking at. If you're not sure, put it in there. We, we keep that updated with a flag if it's in the next like 24 hours or so, or if it just reported. But there's a, a, a field here called next earnings dates, which will, uh, which will tell you. And, uh, you know, Amazon reports tomorrow, that's after the close, uh, much of the NASDAQ 100 reporting earnings this week. And so the reason why I mentioned that uh, during the recap was just to focus on, on stocks like L Brands and others with huge gaps, AMD gapping uh, or moving up again uh, strongly today. And then you have a lot of earnings coming out that's going to cause quick movements in, uh, in a lot of names. A couple ways that you can follow those movements, you know, one is looking at the scooter rankings and L Brands is what uh, comes to mind today with a big gap higher I uh, was looking at this uh, before before the show started. And, you know, it's interesting in L, L Brands, we talked, I, mean, I remember looking at this uh, and thinking, all right, if it can break above the June high, then that would suggest that, you know, there's potential for further upside. Today, we gapped up significantly, and now it's testing resistance at this February high, which is, you know, certainly a, a huge uh, move higher up 35%. So on this sort of gap, it's all about, in my opinion, you think about follow through, you think about what's going to happen afterwards. We've now gapped up to a pretty reasonable, significant resistance level for most stocks that January, February high is sort of the level I would be looking at. The question now is, uh, do we get follow through? Does it follow through tomorrow uh, into next week? Do we are we able to break above that and remain above that, uh, that high from February? Or is this the gap up to sort of the level at which people are pretty happy taking profits and do we start pulling back uh, from here? So while the gap up happened, that certainly was a, a nice surprise to the upside if you own it. If not, I would be looking to see what happens around these uh, this resistance level. And if this holds, because we just are closing above it today, potentially, um, you know, are we able to, to follow through with it uh, tomorrow and beyond? Or does that serve as the resistance you would most likely expect in this, uh, in this sort of, uh, in, in, in a normal environment? 
Also, just wanted to point out very quickly, um, you know, some groups that did very, very well. Uh, we talked about industrials, and I've in general tended to avoid uh, industrials as a sector, but it's worth noting heavy construction, which is one of the groups in there, uh, was one of the top 10 groups. The number one groups was in, uh, was in real estate, real estate services, up almost 10% today. But you'll notice um, things like home construction. This is the home builder group, which we've highlighted. It had a bearish engulfing pattern yesterday, but didn't follow through. It actually rebounded right back up to the upside uh, today, so it feels less negative than it than it certainly appeared to be uh, yesterday. And also within energy, you've got things like ENP stocks in the top ten, uh, which is a, a pretty impressive run for a group that's been struggling. Now, while the reason why I'm not super excited about industrials or groups like this, aerospace, airlines are both in the uh, in the bottom ten, just sort of continuing this uh, downtrend that we've seen for uh, for quite a while. Noteworthy uh, uh, members of this bottom ten group, we highlighted tobacco stocks. Uh, yesterday, if I want to know Monday, I think it was on our um, shifting stock segment on Monday. Uh, we highlighted how tobacco stocks like Philip Morris have uh, have gone to the upside. Yesterday, they have what's called a shooting star pattern on the uh, on the index, which is a the open and, and close very close and at the lower end of the range and sort of a follow through to the downside today. Also, biotech kind of pulling back a little bit. So there are opportunities within biotech, but there's actually kind of a dispersion right now between or a healthy differentiation between. Um, stocks that are working in biotechs and some that aren't as much. So I think, you know, instead of looking at the IBB as a whole, maybe it's more of a tactical opportunity looking at some stock picking within that, uh, within that industry group. That's our recap. I want to take a quick commercial break and we'll be back with my guest, Louis Giannis. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. I want to thank you for joining us every weekday after the close for the show. As a reminder, get your questions to us. We'll do another mailbag segment later in the week. We love hearing from you, answering your questions, helping you navigate these markets using the charting platform we have available to you on StockCharts.com. So shoot us an email, The Final Bar at StockCharts.com or on Twitter. Just tag us in a comment at Final Bar SCTV, and we'd love to hear from you. I want to welcome on my guest, uh, Louis Giannis from WealthNet. Louis is joining us from the Denver area. And uh, Louis, I, I enjoyed so much. You know, it feels like many, many moons ago, last year, I think, or the year before even at the CMT Symposium. Our, but, but your presentation stuck with me so much. I'm, I'm super excited to have you on the show today to, to see, what, see what you're seeing. So welcome to the show. I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for asking me to come on. Of course. Now, I remember from, you know, when I first heard you speak and from your work that I followed factors and, and thinking about factors and how they're differentiated is, it's always been sort of a, a thing that I, I think of when I think of your work. You're starting mm -hmm. us out with a pretty meaty table showing us, you know, returns uh, with some of these different factors. Can you walk us through this and what is it telling you about the current environment? Absolutely. So what this table does is it shows the difference between the top quintile and the bottom quintile of various fundamental factors, as well as price momentum. And the reason why I brought this up as a technician, I'm always looking for what are the technicals saying, but I also want to understand how are analysts that are mostly fundamental, which drives a lot of the institutional marketplace, how are they viewing the market and how are they putting their money to work? And it helps us get an edge by looking at this. And what, we're, what we can really glean from this table, if I can kind of uh, summarize it first and we can get more into the numbers, mm -hmm. is basically we have two regimes that are entering in the marketplace right now. The first is one where companies that are immune to the current lockdown environment and political risks are really being favored. You know, you're seeing that through the quality of earnings numbers that analysts and portfolio managers are focusing in on companies that don't have a lot of gimmicks with accruals. They're looking for high profit margin, low debt, strong cash flow type companies you know, very capital efficient companies, but most importantly, they're looking for basically avoiding those companies that could be hurt if we continue to have this lockdown environment. The second regime that we see is we have this, this uh, there's a lot of money now currently rotating, anticipating a cyclical rebound. It's kind of an anticipation of normal post COVID. 
And uh, th right now, our solution has been to barbell these strategies, and the technicals have really led us in that direction. Very interesting. I, I love that. I love that uh, that thought process. Now, in particular, when you're thinking, you know, recently we've been, you know, I think struggling with potential for leadership change, right? The big technology names that have been leading and, you know, potentially rolling over, you know, looking at your, your, your data, what are you seeing in terms of leadership rotation and where we should be focused? So right now there are, there are some stocks that are selling off that should be completely eliminated from portfolios in our view. Mm. And others are having very healthy corrections. So for example, if you take a look at an Adobe, they're heading into a consolidation pattern, but they're finding very good support and you're, you're seeing a reduction in the volume. That's kind of constructive technical action. And so I think it's really important to look at those types of companies that have the construction technical pauses, if you will, and not just get scared out of those during this. Because, you know, a lot of this is at the margin type movement for the portfolio managers based on our research. And to give you a prime example, in the technology sector, you're seeing sources of funds, meaning selling in the tech sector from like Microsoft and even Apple. But you're seeing some companies that are not necessarily the best companies, not necessarily the fastest growing companies, but companies that have reasonably good businesses that are strong values. Cause you know, a lot of the marketplace, you know, is really looking at value and you're seeing volatility contraction patterns in companies like Cisco, you know, it's not as dynamic, but you're seeing money rotate into Cisco. It doesn't mean necessarily they're going to be the outperformers in the future, but I think that's what we are seeing right now. And there's a potential that you'll see some of that. You're also seeing just a huge rotation going into, like you had mentioned earlier, the residential construction, the Sherwin-Williams, the Mascos, mm. the, you know, the home builders. And that is really being driven by, by demographic changes that are probably not likely to be changing. Actually, they're, they're pretty big trends. So one of the, I will tell you this though, one of the things that we do is we run factor analysis on the liquid markets in the US and the, uh, and the uh, non-US stocks. And one of the biggest things we're seeing is the small cap stocks have, the, have really strong quality and valuation characteristics and they're not being recognized. And they're just now starting to be recognized actually. So I think there's a huge potential in the smaller names. We're seeing, you know, if you look at the, the, the relative strength chart, the small cap index bottomed out relative to the large cap on May 14th. And we were also seeing that the fundamentals are supporting that. So I think that uh, investors, as we feel more comfortable that this is a real rebound, you're going to see those small caps really come to life. It's very, very interesting. We're looking here at the, at the, at the chart of the Russell 2000 ETF, the IWM. And I see what you're saying, right? There's, you know, there's, I think a lot of people have sort of written off small caps for the longest time because, you know, for decent reason, right? I mean, they've been, they've been underperforming for so long. But, you know, if you look in the last couple of weeks, all of a sudden they're starting to, to emerge a little bit. So you're thinking this is a theme we should be paying attention to going forward, it sounds like. So it's, it's something that we should be paying attention to, right? But we want to see the breakouts. Right yeah. now, if you look at the technicals, basically what we're seeing is we're seeing consolidation patterns in the, le in the leaders, and you're seeing bases that are now bringing new emerging breakouts. So I think it's mm -hmm. time to focus in on getting those, catching those new emerging breakouts in those sectors that have, you know, uh, that have kind of been ignored a little bit. Now, we only have about 30 seconds left, Lewis. This has been fascinating, but I, you did send a second chart with, with which you highlight materials. And I think materials is an, is an interesting group because gold obviously has, I mean, almost gone vertical. Um, precious metals in general have done very well. So I think a lot more people are starting to look at materials, gold stocks, and also the other parts of the material space. What, you know, tell us about this relationship between materials and, uh, and tech here. Really, all I wanted to point out was an example of what we're talking about here, this rotation. In the material space, there's a, we can get into some macro reasons of why this is happening, but it's not just gold. It's also the special chemical, chemicals. You know, mm -hmm. look at SMG, for example. Scott's miracle Grow is in that, in that sector. Huge update today. Uh, yeah. You know, one of our holdings, I have to say in full disclosure. But, you know, this is one of those things where I think that there are some unloved stocks. And, of course, we're looking at the valuations and the quality of these companies as well, the fundamentals. They're set up for a larger rise, not just a, a simple, in our view, not just a simple uh, pop that's gonna die. It, it could be a lo longer term trend. Mm. Louis, this has been fascinating. I, I wish we could talk for many, many, uh, <laughs> many, many minutes beyond what we have, but we've run out of time. Uh, thank you so, so much for coming on the show. I'd love to have you back again down the road. And uh, in the meantime, hope you and uh, everyone stay safe in Denver, all right? You too, thank you very much, glad to be here.
That was Lewis Giannis joining us from WealthNet. And, and again, as, as Lewis is talking, I remember what I appreciated so much about his approach. It is quantitatively uh, based, and he can tell you that, you know, the reasons why certain companies, certain themes are emerging and what to pay attention to. But there's always going back to the charts and, and, and you know, in the end, what are the technicals saying about these, uh, these names? And some of the best investors I've ever worked with are the ones that combine fundamental and technical analysis in a meaningful way. And I hope what you got from a little, uh, little time with Luis Giannis is he, is, uh, he, he does that very well. I want to get on to our next segment called Clipping Coupons. So this is our regular attempt to focus in on uh, the fixed income markets. A lot of times, you know, again, we're stockcharts.com. We focus so much on equities, which is, you know, my background and, and, uh, and, and many of you as well. Um, but what I learned from years working with stock pickers is a good stock picker doesn't just look at individual stocks and what they're doing. They have an awareness of how their stocks, their positions are going to be infected, uh, not infected, that was a horrible slip, but affected by all the other potential macro drivers, right? Commodities, the dollar, uh, the euro, the yen, um, uh, interest rates, and, and, and so forth, the yield curve and, and beyond. So this is our attempt to focus in a little bit on, uh, on the fixed income space on, uh, on bonds and see see what we need to see. So I wanted to start with, uh, let's see, one of these charts here, looking at uh, intermarket relationships. What I wanted to highlight here, and sorry, the, the names are a little, uh, a little messed up here, but what I wanted to focus on was just, you know, when we think about uh, the relationship uh, with uh, equities and, uh, and other asset classes, it's important to know sort of where uh, these, uh, these different asset classes are lining up. And what I've seen just looking at the last month or so is uh, and again, apologies for, for this mishmash of things. We have stocks and the uh, the Nasdaq, the S and P and the Nasdaq here up about six to seven percent over the last uh, over the last month. Small caps not too far behind, up six percent. This is bonds uh, down here up three percent. Then you have gold up eleven percent. You have Bitcoin up much further. You have dollar down here uh, at the uh, at the lower end. What's happened recently though is if you look at these lines in the last little bit. Bonds and stocks have actually been in lockstep and bonds have actually started to just outperform bonds just in the last, uh, you know, last week or so. You've seen this, uh, a, bit of this, uh, a bit of this rotation. What I wanted to do was show you uh, the ratio of stocks versus bonds. And I'm going to do that here. Stocks versus bonds. Here we go. So this is a ratio of the S&P and the TLT. So we're going to focus on, uh, on, on bond markets in particular here in a second. But I wanted to show you this ratio uh, between the two. When this line is going down, that means stocks are underperforming bonds. When the line is going up, that means stocks are outperforming bonds. You can see leading up to the peak in January to February of this year, bonds had been outperforming uh, or sorry, stocks had been outperforming pretty consistently. This is the ratio going higher. You can see then the lower peak here in February. This is when you know a lot of stocks peaked in January. This ratio actually peaked in January as well, a lower peak in February, and then rolled over. And this is when obviously being in bonds would have been a, a pretty good experience during this point with some, uh, with some upside as, uh, as stocks were, were going down aggressively. The TLT actually chopped around pretty good. But starting the clock on March 23rd, the next uh, you know, eight to 10 weeks clearly favored uh, equities over bonds as you had that V bottom in a, lot, in a lot of equities. But what's happened since then is you have sort of this even uh, relative performance with the SPY and the TLT showing you stocks and bonds in general returning about the same over the last, uh, the last three to four weeks. So where does that leave us now? Well, I think what you want to do is, you know, understanding that these are moving together is look at equities, which we do a great deal. Look at bonds separately from that and see what sort of, uh, see what sort of patterns uh, potentially emerge there. So what we'll do here is go to a chart of the TLT. This is usually our go-to chart when I'm talking about bond returns. I usually start here. Um, and, you know, what's happened when you look at bond prices is uh, here's the uh, January, February peak in stocks was about here. You can see that the TLT essentially went vertical as stocks were going down. That's why that ratio uh, went down so quickly. But then you can see going into the March low, there was a bit of choppiness as the TLT went from you know, the upper 170s down to the you know, upper 130s. From there though, sort of stabilized. And what's happened in the last month is you can see the TLT has rotated above trendline resistance, above the most recent swing high and has now made a steady pattern of higher highs and higher lows. We have both stocks and bonds making the similar pattern 
of higher highs and higher lows. What concerns me at this point is you have this trifecta of stocks, bonds, and gold all in a short-term uptrend. And while that's good, if you own any one of those assets, in general, that tends to be unsustainable. It reminds me a little bit of that January to February period. So that mid-February period, you had everything going higher. Stocks, bonds, uh, gold, even the dollar was going up at that point. And I remember thinking, uh, you know, that's unsustainable. One of these things at least has to uh, start to differentiate. So I think we're in that sort of uh, condition now. And I think, you know, what starts to give? Do you see bond prices rolling over? Um, do you see stock prices rolling over, correcting a little bit? Or do you see gold starting to uh, turn to come off? The fact that gold's so overextended makes me think short-term weakness you might see from precious metals. Uh, we haven't seen enough of it uh, uh, yet so far. And I, and I think obviously it's just, uh, it's been, it's appreciated so well, but the TLT is another thing to, uh, to be looking for. And again, all you need to do is start drawing trend lines from those lows and see which one starts to break. And that'll, I think give you an early warning as much as you can about what might uh, start to roll over. While we're looking at bonds, I think it's worth looking at the HYG, the high yield ETF. Um, and this is where obviously the Fed made announcements about uh, directly buying uh, bond ETFs. That's where you had the huge jump in the HYG here in early April. From there, you've again had this consistent pattern of higher highs and higher lows. Over the last week, the HYG has actually tested that resistance from early June and now has broken above it as well. So this is showing a familiar pattern. Again, the high yield ETF tends to look a lot like uh, the chart of the S&P, the SPY, uh, you know, on average, because it's similar things, you're looking more on the riskier side of the, uh, of the fixed income markets, but you have uh, here higher highs in price, lower peaks uh, in, the, uh, in the RSI. There's that divergence, uh, potential divergence that we've seen in other places. But again, with something like this, you want to see if a new high is established on lower momentum. We haven't quite had that yet because the HYG continuing to go uh, to, the, uh, to the upside here. All of that has moved uh, 10 year yields and other uh, parts of the uh, yield curve uh, even lower. We're coming down here to the uh, the yield index. You can see that the 10 year yield essentially almost at, at, at uh, all time lows, uh, testing the lower end of that below 60 basis points uh, yet again. The question I'm always faced with when I start talking about bond prices, how high can bond prices go? Because isn't there a limit? And I think, yes, there, there are um, you know, some literal limits and some, um, you know, I think understood limits in terms of how high bond prices could go because of how low you could push yields. You could see negative yields. That means bond prices certainly have some upside, but at some point there are some uh, challenges that are, that are faced if you have extreme low yields and extreme uh, high bond prices. So there, there are some, you know, potentially sort of theoretical uh, peaks to prices. But again, until I see the trend reverse, I'm assuming that the trend is up. And that's what I'm seeing with bond prices uh, at the moment with yields going lower as well. That's our segment clipping coupons, just trying to hit on some of the key themes looking at uh, the fixed income markets. And again, I think the main takeaway for me is thinking of stocks, bonds, and golds, and the just the implied risk of having all three of them in a positive short-term trend. One of those has got to give here pretty soon. We need to wrap the show, go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Let's go there right now. We didn't talk a lot about commodities today. We talked a little bit about uh, uh, gold materials with, uh, with Lewis Giannis, but I did want to point out with crude oil contract, when I'm looking at crude oil, you know, this is a narrowing of the Bollinger Bands. John Bollinger, uh, you know, has often said a narrowing of the bands, a lower volatility environment means you would expect a break one way or the other. And the bands by themselves don't imply a particular direction. It just implies a break is coming. And I've often found whichever way the market breaks, that tends to be the direction of momentum. What you do want to look for is some sort of follow through. So if we would break to the upside, some sort of follow through, even a retest of the breakout level and then a move a little further. And I think you could expect higher oil prices, but this would be the opportunity for some sort of breakdown. Again, you look for a break to a new swing low and that would tell you further downside for oil, but it's at that consolidation point where you'd be looking for a break. Chart number two is the real estate ETF XLRE. Uh, IYR is another one that's pretty liquid that people follow. I think it's worth noting here, you have a bit of a symmetrical triangle, lower peaks in price, uh, sorry, lower highs, uh, higher lows. That's a consolidation coming off of the depressed levels from late March. That has uh, so far now resolved to the upside. Back above the 200-day uh, is now closed above the, uh, the July high. So you'd want to see some follow-through. It's all about the follow-through day. Uh, tomorrow through the end of the week is uh, real estate utilities is another one testing its 200-day uh, moving average from below. Finally, a lot of gaps right now, and there, there will be plenty more uh, before all is said and done. I think with earnings uh, coming out heavily this week, you have a lot of uh, mega cap stocks in the next 24 hours. Uh, AMD is 
the one that gapped uh, to the upside. This is in relation to Intel to Taiwan Semiconductor, uh, but it's up another 12.5%. And I think the semiconductor group overall performing pretty well. That's our show for today. A special thank you to Louis Giannis from WealthNet joining us on the show today. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.